Hello, everyone. Welcome to More Than Amused podcast. My name is Sadie. I'm Stani, and happy Thanksgiving if you're yes. American, and happy end of November if you're not. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> Hope everyone had a lovely holiday, snagged some things with Black Friday deals. We are pre-recording, if you can't tell, because I'll be traveling for Thanksgiving. At this point, I can say that I went home, surprised my family. I couldn't so talk exciting. about it in obviously last week's episode because yeah. in case they listened. But anyways, so hope everyone is recovering. Holidays were net good experience. Yes, <laughs> that is the hope. Hopefully the weather is beautiful wherever you are. Mm-hmm. Right now it is pouring rain. So, Oh, really? Yeah. It's like really wet. <laughs> it's like an oddly beautiful day here, but... Wow, this is so interesting talking about the weather. But I'm like, I think Utah is going to have like a really cold winter again. Like last year we had like early snow and then it went really late into the year. Oh. And from the look of things, I think it's going to happen it's again. It's happening again. So, hmm. yeah, bring a coat when you come. <laughs> Actually, good advice that I might have forgotten that I'm like, oh, yeah, it's cold. Home is mm-hmm. cold. <laughs> well, today we are staying in theme of Thanksgiving and mm-hmm. talking about... I guess just women being in the kitchen. Yes. A controversial subject. A controversial (laughs) subject indeed. So we're going to be talking about some of the biggest women celebrity chefs, whether that's through Food Network, having their own TV show, but also some that just made their mark on the cooking world in general. Mm -hmm. I feel like I should say primarily America. Um, Yes, that's a good point. Yeah, or the United States. Sorry, I know some people get really annoyed when we call it America, and that's totally fair. It's the United States. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, But we wanted to focus on that partially because we live here, but also just like the United States is like a weird thing, you know, like it was a new country. And so cuisine had a chance to be introduced in a very different way here. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of different things like French, Chinese, Creole cooking all entered in very interesting ways. So it was kind of fun to find people who contributed to all of those different things making it to the new continent you know yeah no that's true to start off too i also want to shout out oh not shout out like the the negative version of shout out (laughs) mention the fact and the statistics behind how many women are chefs versus men so mm-hmm. the workforce of chefs and head cooks in 2020 was 458,000 people, roughly. And 22% of that was women and 78% were men. What's interesting, though, is if you take that a step further and look at women as the head chef positions at like prominent U.S. restaurants, I don't exactly know what the Forbes article was labeling as prominent restaurants, maybe like like, five-star high-end restaurants, only 6.3% of those chefs are women. So it's like the higher, more fine dining, it's even even lesser. But what I thought was even so interesting is that if you kind of compare that to the demographic breakdown of students going into culinary school, is that 51% of them are female. So it's interesting that it's like those going to culinary school, it's actually pretty 50-50. But then if you actually look at the breakdowns of head chefs and head cooks, it ends up being a lot wider of a gap, which means that something's actually happening there. You can't really make the excuse of, well, maybe women aren't interested in being chefs. Like, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. There's 50% of them, you know, are women. Gosh, I'm actually shocked how closely that mirrors art students and like Mm -hmm. other positions because we've talked about that before too of like art school is prominently women probably more Mm -hmm. than 50 percent and even um graduate programs it's even higher of women in the demographics and yet leadership positions in the arts Mm -hmm. are majorly men by like a huge margin so it's interesting that it happens in this too it's a very weird thing Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Forbes article, too, that I was referencing pointed out to how, again, it's very similar in like Fortune 500 companies and CEO breakdowns where like 6% of Fortune 500 CEOs are female and how that's similar to the 6.3% of head chef positions in the prominent restaurant groups, which I think just shows how like it's not like an anomaly in this one profession. Yeah, it's mirroring itself along all types of demographics and 
all industries and regardless it's even of it. crazier to think about with cooking and baking especially because like i think it was sixth grade for us when people started using like go make me a sandwich as a way to essentially tell women to just shut up yes mm-hmm. and like boys would say it all the time in junior time. high and not even really understanding what it meant I think, or just thinking it was funny. Yeah. And then the whole idea of like women belong in the kitchen. And so it's just interesting that it's like, oh, women belong in the kitchen until they're being paid to be there or in charge Mm -hmm. of the kitchen. And then you don't want them there anymore. No, that's so, so true. And another thing we talked a lot about on this podcast is like how it seems that like women are allowed to take up space if it's as a hobby, you know, Mm -hmm. same thing where it's like, oh, it's great to be a home baker. It's great to be a home chef, which granted, there's nothing wrong with being a home baker or home chef. I want to make that clear. Yeah. Um, But like that's (laughs) encouraged. But as soon as someone takes the step again and say, no, I want to be paid for this and I want to be a leader in this, it's like that's when all of a sudden the disparity is shocking. Ah, I was going to find this quote and I forgot. I'll try and find it to post. But they asked a bunch of like prominent male chefs, like some of the best known ones in the world, who they thought made the best food. And all of them, for the most part, answered their mother. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so it just shows it even more that it's like there's these women who are probably only cooking in the home that for the their greatest families. chefs in the world consider mm-hmm. greater than their own food. You know, and that like there's kind of that problem there of like, hmm, interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, that is interesting. Uh, and it's it's so sad, too, that like, yeah, a lot of those people. I mean, I guess in that instance, they were being recognized by their children but like in general it is yeah woman's work that is unrecognized or almost like deemed as something that they should be good at so it's not something to recognize you know where it's like oh a housewife needs to be a good cook so we're not going to reward that or like hold that in a high esteem because oh that's their job as wife and mother definitely it's when like it is make the food and it has to taste good and mm-hmm. And yet, like, no recognition, yeah. no pay. You're not even a professional chef. And yet you're putting, like, perfectly cooked dishes that are better than most restaurant food on the dinner table every single night. Like, that is mm-hmm. insane. No, that's that ridiculous. Is, totally. And oh my gosh, you mentioning that, I totally forgot. But, like, that unlocked a memory of middle school. That was the... That was the whole bit. Yeah. Go make me a sandwich. I'm like, that is not funny. Like, Shut not up. Not funny at all. <laughs> no, it's not funny. It's like, go make yourself a sandwich. Yeah. Because you'll actually get paid to make one. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> one other thing I wanted to bring up really quick is that this kind of idea of like television cooking show personalities, mm. it's not new. It's been around for a really long time, which is no shock. It actually started in radio, which I mm. thought was really fun, obviously right but because radios were kept for the most part in people's kitchens and so it became like a thing to entertain women where they would have them cooking they'd turn on their radio and Mm -hmm. they could hear people talking about food or cooking or tips you know like stuff like that it was the major market of the radio industry was women obviously and so they were doing that and then later um the first cooking show was broadcast in the united kingdom on the bbc in 1946 and it was with philip harbin it was a show called cookery and it was 10 minutes long and in the first episode he showed them how to make a lobster which i'm like okay cool (laughs) wow very ambitious yeah um apparently he had also done previous like food programs on the radio and so that's why they moved him over to that and then the first woman i could find was marguerite Patton. she was like an english home economist and wartime food consultant and uh she had like a uk cooking show called design for women in 1947 and then it like continued on ever since then so there's a lot of names i found on this list that i'm like we'll definitely have to cover in the future obviously we chose like more prominent and then a few unknown names from like the american food scene Mm -hmm. but yeah like food shows have been around since like the 1940s or earlier on radio like it's a very very common thing and apparently Betty Crocker even had a radio show in 1924 even though Betty Crocker isn't a real person I was just gonna say (laughs) yeah (laughs) I remember learning that very recently I mean within the years of doing the podcast because it was like oh we have to do Betty Crocker for an episode she's fake she's not real (laughs) she doesn't exist she is a concept (laughs) yep but she had a cookie show a radio cooking show in 1924 so okay well now i want to know it's like the author of nancy drew right i know like like, who was betty crocker yeah who was the voice of betty crocker then (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, we'll have to look into that and report yeah, back. Definitely. We have six women that we'll be shouting out and briefly telling their stories today and talking about their contributions to the world of cooking and a lot of times I said TV, honestly, mm -hmm. it's like entertainment almost as much as cooking for some oh, of these women. Definitely. So, I yeah. don't cook or bake and I watch the British baking show. Love it. I watched it last night. Yeah. Uh, so I'm enjoyable. Also, I, I just think show. it's like so pure that they don't win any money. They get yes. a bouquet of flowers and a plate. I'm like, that is like so pure. The, <laughs> the biggest signifier of the difference between like American culture. I know. Like, these people are going every weekend for weeks and weeks. It's like 12 weeks, isn't There's it? There's no cash prize. There's no. no... I mean, like, I'm sure they get some type... You know, their Instagram followings grow, I'm sure. Like, but still, they can capitalize on US it. people and they get like $50,000. I, I know. It's crazy. Yeah. Like, isn't there enough funding they could throw like a little bit <laughs> their way? Oh my like, God. Take, take $100. Like, yeah. I don't know. No, Along I know, but, it, of but I love it because I think it keeps the it keeps the energy of the show the same. It's and I, so I cute. Love it. I know mm -hmm. they're just there, just because they're to they be love there. Baking. It's so cute. I love that show. I love that show too. Okay, so the first person I'm talking about is MFK Fisher, and that stands for Mary Frances Kennedy Fisher Parish Free Free Day. I think. Ooh, okay. Very long name. Mm -hmm. She was born in July of 1908 and was mainly known for, like, being an American food writer. She also was the founder of the Napa Valley Wine Library, which mm. Napa Valley is, like, a huge wine yeah. place. So that was very – she was very fundamental to that process. She wrote 27 books, including translating The Physiology of Taste mm. and believed that eating well was one of the arts of life and explored this in her writing. Love that. And the New York Times editorial board even said, calling MFK Fisher, who has just been elected to the American Academy and National Institute of Arts and Letters, a food writer, is a lot like calling Mozart a tunesmith. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So yeah. basically saying like she was so much more than a food writer. I wanted to talk about like her earliest memories of food because I thought it was so interesting. Mm -hmm. She said that food became an early passion in her life. Her earliest memory of taste was the grayish pink fuzz my grandmother skimmed from a spitting kettle of strawberry jam. It was like interesting. Does not sound mm -hmm. appealing to me, but... <laughs> but hey, <laughs> early as her <laughs> taste, yes. Her maternal grandmother lived with their family until she passed away in 1920. And during that time, it was like a tension in the household because her grandmother was a very stern Campbellite, which was like a religion at the time, a lot like Mennonite, I think. Oh, And they okay. firmly believed in like overcooked bland food. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then she also is a follower of Dr. John Harvey Kellogg's dietary restrictions at the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Not sure what that means, but wow, Kellogg has been around for a really long time. I That's was what just going to say. Her. That's a significant name. Yeah. Yeah. And then she would later write that during her grandmother's absences, like her grandmother would leave to go to these religious conventions and they would indulge in food when she was gone. Oh. So they would have things like marshmallows and hot chocolate. Thin pastry under the Tuesday hash, rare roast beef on Sunday instead of boiled hen. A mother ate all she wanted of cream of fresh mushroom soup. Father served a local wine. Red ink, he called it with the steak. We ate grilled sweetbreads and skewered kidneys with a daring dash of sherry on them. Oh, love so that. So I thought that was kind of fun that like her early memories of food were kind of like this mm -hmm. celebration of like an exploration of flavors because yeah. their daily meals were so bland. Uh, she also talked about another food influence was Aunt Gwen. She wasn't family, but the daughter of friends that were like this family of English medical missionaries who lived in tents. So had, they had this like encampment on Laguna Beach and she would go out there and camp with them at times. And they would cook outdoors and steam mussels on fresh seaweed over hot coals, catch and fry rock bass, skin and cook eel, and make fried egg sandwiches to carry on hikes. So just like very diverse cooking experiences. And then she said that age nine, she decided that one of the best ways to grow up is to eat and talk quietly with good people. I mean, I agree. Yeah. I love that. So that's kind of like what sent her forward. She lived in a ton of different places. I literally cannot talk about all of them because it went on for a really long time. So there's a lot to this woman. I am barely mm -hmm. scratching the surface and I really want to emphasize that. 
one thing that she was really known for is just like this lyrical prose and then like talking about the emotional and sensual aspects of food, like really bringing it into her writing, like how important food is for like gatherings and connections Mm -hmm. with people and like relationships. And she also focused a lot on what's called gastronomic theory and like writing. And that was something I had never heard before. It's Mm -hmm. like called gastronomy and I was like oh is this like a health food thing basically it's the practice or art of choosing cooking and eating good food excellent yeah I'm like that sounds wonderful but that was like a huge thing about her like theory and everything with cooking too so Mm -hmm. she wrote a lot of acclaimed books there was serve it forth consider the oyster how to cook a wolf um and all of these addressed challenges of cooking during wartime rationing so that was like a major thing too like how to cook good food with what little you do have and then she also expanded like her impact on the world of food beyond her cookbooks she would explore themes of love desire the human experience she would weave in personal narratives with culinary observations just kind of like showing food writing as a legitimate literary pursuit which hadn't that. really been done before. Mm-hmm. Um, it was actually funny. In one of the things that she she wrote a book towards the end of her life and she sent it to the publishers. And when she got the final result, she was really upset about it because they had cut out like all of her musings and writing and stuff. And like she said, basically took the personality out of it. Oh. Yeah. So but she wrote a lot of books. And then um, she also was a major advocate for fresh seasonal ingredients, more of a mindful approach to eating, and then emphasized the importance of savoring and appreciating each meal, promoting a philosophy that shows like slow food, sustainable dining Mm -hmm. that continues today. So that's her like huge impact on food writing, kind of made it a thing. And Yeah. yeah, just wrote millions of books. Not millions, but a lot. (laughs) Sold millions, probably. Yes. (laughs) There we go. (laughs) I like want to go read more. I feel like, like, is that maybe set the precedence for, I know people will complain about like when they find a food blog or a recipe that they get, you know, they have all of this information before. And I'm like, "Hmm, I wonder if that was almost like the precedence for that. Probably. I know a lot of that is also like search engine optimization, Mm -hmm. which is fair. I get it. But I mean, sometimes you've got to enjoy like, the narrative. No, I, I like the background story yeah. of like, why this recipe? Where did it come from? I'm I I'm honestly pro. Glad it's there. <laughs> yeah. But however, that little jump to recipe button is also a very blessed thing. <laughs> I love jump to recipe. That's very true. <laughs> well, my first person that um, I'll be talking about is someone that I hadn't heard of before, but it's Buai Yang Chow. And she was a Chinese-American physician and writer. She was actually one of the very first women to practice Western medicine in China. So that was how she started out. She didn't start out as a cook. So I'm going to dive into her life a little bit more than the other ones. But she was born in Nanjing into the Yang family. Uh, But she was raised by her aunt and uncle. And at a very young, she was sent to school. I just love this anecdote about her where I guess the entry exam of her school they required her to write about the benefits of educating girls. And she just responded saying women are the mothers of all citizens. So I don't know. You know, it is can be as simple as that. (laughs) Yeah. I love that. Yes, I know. I liked it. Uh, And then later she went to an all girl Roman Catholic school in Shanghai and then later went to Japan to attend the Tokyo Women's Medical College. So she moved to Tokyo for studies in medicine. And (laughs) she later claimed that she only became interested in cooking after finding Japanese food to be inedible. So, yeah, she moved to Japan. (laughs) She did not like their cuisine. And so Mm -hmm. it inspired her to really learn how to, you know, cook food from home. In 1919, she returned home at the request of her father, but he passed away before she could see him. Oh, that's so sad. I know. It is very sad. And then she ended up being established in the Sen Ren Hospital specializing in gynecology. And she was among the very first female doctors practicing Western medicine in China. So paved the way in a totally different field before she became a chef or a cookbook writer. In 1920, she met and then married a linguist, Y.R. Chow, on January 1st, 1921, is when they were married. And together, they had four daughters. And then 
eldest of her daughters named Rulan Chow actually helped her with the writing of her books of recipes. Bu Wai wrote three books, two of which are maybe more notable. And the first one is How to Cook and Eat in Chinese. And then the other was an autobiography of a Chinese woman. So they actually moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts. Her husband got a teaching position actually at Harvard. It was during World War II that they lived and moved to Massachusetts. Her husband was conducting language training for the U.S. Army, and she would prepare meals for the instructors just using local ingredients. And so during this time, I think she was like basically just bored at home didn't really have anything to do. And so with the help of her daughter, she prepared over 230 recipes. Some came from her travels with her husband as he collected dialogue data from across China. And then they would often live with the subjects of his language research, which is cool because like she probably just got to see her entire home country of China because yeah. of that, really get hands on with, you know, just individual cultures all over the country. She mentioned, though, that the recipes from those days were not written down. She often recreated them from her memory of their te- tastes. Oh, um, my gosh. I would never be able to do that. Are you kidding? No way. Boo, I actually opened her book saying, I didn't write the book. The way I didn't was like this. You know, I speak little English and write less. So I cooked my dishes in Chinese. My daughter, Rulon, put my Chinese into English. And my husband, finding the English dull, put much of it back into Chinese again. What I thought was interesting is that together with her husband being like a linguist, they coined the terms pot sticker and stir fry for her Chinese recipe book, which are just now widely accepted terms. And like the reason why is because she was trying to like almost explain a Chinese way of cooking something Mm -hmm. and did her very best to translate it. And there wasn't a direct translation. So they would just kind of, you know, create a new phrase to summarize it. And now, I mean, stir fry, that's not a method of cooking, really. That's like a dish. You know, we know what a stir fry is, but it comes from her cookbooks and is that term, which I thought was really cool. That is so Um, cool. Like I mentioned, she couldn't really speak English. Jason Epstein of the New York Times, who later met the couple as a publisher of a reprint of one of her books, claims that as the author could not speak or write much English, it must have been her husband who wrote in her name. However, the husband told an interviewer that Rulon did the translation, quote, she would complain sometimes, daddy, you have so many footnotes, somebody will think that you translated the book, but no, she was the translator. So another example of people being like, oh, well, this must have been the man. But no, it was actually like, no, mostly was a mother daughter joint <laughs> venture that translated this. And I'm, you know, but I'm sure he also mm-hmm. inserted himself. There's a really good article that I just wanted to shout out from motherjones.com, Cole, just from a couple of years ago about her. And that's where I got a couple of these quotes, but it said the cookbook succeeded despite its linguistic kinks and strained family dynamics going into multiple printings by the end of 1945, though critics largely overlooked the anger in Chow's words. English language Chinese cookbooks have been published as far back as 1911 in the United States, but Chow's was the first that refused to westernize Chinese cooking. Quote, I'll show you how to cook crab dishes with real crabs, uh, she wrote to readers in a passage where she forbade them from using sea crabs in place of the freshwater variety. Using the former, she reasoned, would result in a caricature of the Chinese dish. And then during Chow's era, it might have been easier for immigrants in the culinary er arena to please the American palate with substitutions, but she didn't budge. So she very much was like, no, I'm going to show you how to make Chinese food. I'm not going to water it down at all. I also really loved this pointing out. So the the cookbook's publicity campaign championed it as a document of hope. It emerged just two years after the United States repealed parts of the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which was a law that put a cap on Chinese immigration. And so it pointed out that maybe those who were involved in promoting her book, it kind of seemed that she was like a kind of like a cultural ambassador in the wake of that law being repealed. I also really loved this quote that said, in many respects, Chow was ahead of her time. She wrote her Chinese heritage with pride and shunned the impulse to compromise it. Chow's contribution to American food culture should have been enough to etch her into headlines, but the New York Times did not even dignify her with an obituary upon her death in 1981, and her name fell through Pop's culture's crack shortly thereafter. How many other culinary pioneers like Chow, immigrants who didn't silence their differences to gain broad approval await rediscovery. Which, I mean, you talked that about that at the beginning with like America and, you know, all the people that were immigrating here. 
that, you know, kind of created the culture at large. And I just like how they pointed out the fact that she very, very quickly became unrecognized and just kind of seeped through the cracks after her death, which is something we talk about all the time where there's women who are who reach great fame while they're alive. And then after their death, they just so quickly fade away from the conversations. And who knows how many other ones are also out there that left their mark on the world that are still not being recognized for that. You know, sometimes that haunts me. Yes, (laughs) it really (laughs) does. Because that's the whole point of this podcast, right, is to talk about Mm -hmm. women that have been ignored by history or just like completely forgotten. And sometimes it just like makes me so angry that it's like there's probably so many that we will never, ever be able to find. Yeah. Like, and what if we just can't find them? I know. know. Uh, I'm like, no. (laughs) I know. Uh, Truly haunting. Yeah. But yeah, so there's um, Boo Wai. You can thank her for pot stickers, stir fry, all of that. I will. Absolutely. Love Chinese food. Okay, the next person I'm talking about is probably one of the most famous celebrity chefs Mm -hmm. in American history, and that is Julia Child, of course. She had her own cooking show. Um, She had a bunch of cookbooks. She had a television program. There was so much. So she was born on August 1912 in Pasadena, California. And I thought this is so interesting. She tried to join the Women's Army Corps, or the U.S. Navy, like women's, the women's Navy, it's called Waves. Cool. And they wouldn't let her because she was too tall. How tall was she? She was 6'2". Wow, she was tall. Yeah. But I'm like, that's tall for a man, but do they have limits on how tall men can be in the army? I don't know. That's what I, I feel yeah, like that's I don't, like a I weird thing. But yeah, so too she was tall. very tall, but they wouldn't let her join the military. She joined... The Office of Strategic Services, which was like helping military efforts. And so she started her career as a typist at their headquarters in Washington, D.C. But then because of her education and experience, they gave her a more responsible position as a top secret researcher working directly for the head of the OSS, General William J. Donovan. And basically what she did was she would type over 10,000 names on white note cards and then they would like keep track of officers. And she worked specifically for the emergency sea rescue equipment section as an assistant to developers of a shark repellent. (laughs) It gets weird for a minute here. (laughs) So she was like keeping track of like emergency sea rescue equipment, right? And like finding lost officers. But then they like were trying to research shark repellent so that sharks wouldn't explode ordinances targeting German (laughs) U-boats because they were like the sharks were setting off too many underwater explosives because they were curious about the things underwater in their space and they were trying to like I know it's ridiculous and they were trying to like target the German U-boats but then they were like wasting explosives and killing sharks because (laughs) they like were going up to them and setting them off what a weird problem I never knew existed. I, I know. How strange, right? And so yeah. her solution was she was like cooking concoctions as shark repellent. And then they would sprinkle it in the water near the explosives and it would repel the sharks. Okay. Yeah. And it's still in use today. That's um, crazy. <laughs> yeah. So kind of like a weird little turn there. But that was like her first foray into the world of cooking was making shark repellent. I love how like I think most of the people I'm talking about are not traditional chefs at all. They just kind of stumble upon it. So Mm -hmm. I love that this is a continuing trend with yours (laughs) as well. Shark repellent. Yeah. Okay. So then she was posted in candy cylon which is not sri lanka and that was to like register catalog and channel classified communications for oss and throughout like the stations in asia Mm -hmm. and then she ended up in china and then received the emblem of a meritorious civilian service as the head of the registry of the oss secretariat she did wonderful things she got an award they included in her award that part of why she received it was for her drive and inherent cheerfulness okay which i love and um, as with other oss records her file was declassified in 2008 so you can actually read her complete oss military file online if you want to (laughs) i mean i don't know if i do but i just like that you could have like i could (laughs) if i wanted to yep you can 
if you really mm-hmm. feel like it. When she was actually in Sri Lanka, she met Paul Cushing Child, who was an OSS employee, and they got married. And then they moved to Washington, D.C., And Paul was a New Jersey native, but he had lived in Paris as an artist and poet for a really long time. And he had a very sophisticated palette that he was known for. And so he introduced his wife to fine Parisian cuisine. There we go. (laughs) And when he joined the United States Foreign Service, they moved to Paris and they spent some time there where she learned about Parisian food. Um, her first meal that she recalled there was La Corone in Rouen, and it was a meal of oysters and a bunch of French stuff I can't say and fine wine. Nice. <laughs> and she called it an opening up of the soul and spirit for me. Aww. And then while she was there, she also graduated from the famous Cordon Bleu Cooking School in Paris and then also studied privately with Max Bunyard and other master chefs. Wow. Yeah, so she got like a whole cooking degree while in Paris. She also joined a woman's cooking club, Le Circle des Gourmets, and met Simone Beck, who was writing a French cookbook for Americans through her friend, Lucette Bertel. So then they decided to like have her work with them to make the book appeal to Americans more because she was American. And then they began teaching the cooking from the book to American women in her Paris kitchen calling their informal school Les Ecoles de Troy Gourmandes, or the School of Three Food Lovers. And I'm sure my French is horrendous. So. I love it. Okay. <laughs> That's cool. cool. You all get to hear my horrible French, pron- French pronunciation. For the next decade, they moved around Europe and then finally ended up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the three of them would like research and test recipes together. And then she ended up translating most of the French into English to make the recipes more detailed, interesting, and practical. Um, The three would-be authors signed a contract with Hutton Mifflin, and later they rejected the manuscript because they said it sounded too much like an encyclopedia. (laughs) Interesting. Yeah, but it was finally published in 1961, and it was a 726-page book called Mastering the Art of French Cooking. Wow. Very long. It was a bestseller. And it received critical acclaim that derived in part from American interest in French cuisine in the 1960s. I could see that, actually, because America was trying to get all very refined and stuff. Yeah. Um, It had, like, really helpful illustrations. There was precise attention to detail. It made, like, this fine cuisine that seemed so unaccessible very accessible because you could, like, buy the book and actually make this stuff. Instead of it just being like, oh, served in the finest restaurants in Paris and you have no idea what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. She also would write magazine articles and a regular column for the Boston Globe newspaper and ended up publishing nearly 20 tiles under her name and with others. And then many of them were related to later her television shows. And then she also has an autobiography called My Life in France that was published after her death that she wrote with her grandnephew, Alex. And it talks about, like, her whole life in post-war France, if you want to hear more about that. How she ended up on TV. So she appeared on what was then the National Education Television Network in Boston, um, which is now part of PBS. And they were doing – it was, like, a book review show. Okay. And so they brought her on to, you know, like, review the book. And she ended up doing, like, a demonstration of how to cook an omelet. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. And then it led to her getting a cooking show because, like, the viewers loved seeing her cook an omelet so much that they were like, we want to see her on TV more. So she had a show called The French Chef, which debuted as a summer pilot series in 1962 and then led to a regular series in 1963, and it was immediately successful. It actually ran nationally for 10 years. And won Peabody and Emmy Awards. And it was also the first Emmy Award for an educational program, which is incredible, right? Yeah. Um, She was not the first television cook, but she was the most widely seen. Like we talked about, there was plenty before, Mm -hmm. plenty after, but she was very widely seen and very popular. And she also attracted a very broad audience because she had like 
cheery enthusiasm, a very distinct voice. Mm -hmm. And she was like very unpatronizing. Like she wasn't trying to seem like she knew everything. Nobody knew anything better than her. Like she was just very approachable. And even like looking at a picture of her, I feel like you could see it. You're just like, yeah, Yeah. like definitely. (laughs) Yeah. It also was the first television program to be captioned for the death. Oh, cool. Which is so cool because it was done using like preliminary technology of like open captioning, which is now a standard for most shows. Mm -hmm. So that's really cool. Her second book, the French Chef Cookbook, was a collection of recipes that she had demonstrated on the show. Soon after, she wrote one called Mastering the Art of French Cooking, Volume 2, that was in collaboration again with her friend Simone Beck. And then her fourth book... From Julia Child's Kitchen was illustrated with her husband's photographs and documented the color series The French Chef, as well as provided an extensive library of kitchen notes compiled by her throughout the course of the show. Love that. Yeah. So like these really wonderful cookbooks and her show along with it. One of the things I loved is they actually talked about that she had such an impact on American households and housewives because... One of the things that was so fun, and I kind of wish they still did this with cooking shows, because of the technology, the show was unedited. Oh, yeah. And so she messed up. It stayed in the final one, and you had to, like, watch her fix it. But it led to this, like, authenticity and approachability because, like, they were seeing her even as, like, a professional, you know, celebrity chef mess up on some recipes. And that Mm -hmm. made it seem so much easier for everyone. So, like, American households and housewives were very endeared by her and, like, very Mm -hmm. encouraged by her. I'm like, that's kind of cool. I like that. (laughs) Yeah, that is so nice. Yeah. And then... They did, like, this show about, like, French cuisine and the television palette and everything, and Toby Miller got a quote from a woman that said that all that stood between me and insanity was hardy Julia Child because of her ability to soothe and transport me. And you think about, like, we've talked about 1960s, very dire time, and 1950s, 1960s for American housewives. Yes. <laughs> Obviously not the worst time in history, but like pretty bad. They you had know? their own set of issues. For <laughs> yeah. Sure. Mm-hmm. And one of the major things a lot of women dealt with was like loneliness and kind of literally just having to be on tranquilizers because they were alone at home all day having to like clean the house and cook. And that's all that they were allowed to do mm-hmm. and raise the children. And so I think it's like very notable that like Julia Child was able to kind of be like a friend to them in those yeah. moments of like dire loneliness because she was able to help them. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> yeah. And they also noted that her show began before the feminist movement of the 1960s, which meant that a lot of the issues housewives and women face were being ignored in media and on television. And so just having someone there to like kind of guide them through something as simple as like cooking because they were expected to know how to do it mm-hmm. would be like a huge aid. She went on to be the star of a bunch of more television programs that continued. There was Julia Child and Company, Julia Child and More Company, <laughs> and Love Dinner at Julia's. And her book for Julia Child and More Company actually won a National Book Award in the category of Current Interest. And then in 1980, she started appearing regularly on Good Morning America. Yeah. In 1981, she founded the American Institute of Wine and Food, and it was to advance the understanding, appreciation, and quality of wine and food in the United States. In 1989, this is what she considered her magnum opus. It was like the work of works and it was a book and instructional video series that was entitled the way to cook oh cute yeah and i'm like wow what a great place to start like maybe i should read that literally (laughs) she also was really concerned about children's food education and made a lot of steps towards trying to promote healthier food for children on that note (laughs) <laughs> Her use of ingredients like butter and cream have been questioned by food critics and modern day nutritionists because obviously everyone's like butter is bad, cream is bad. She addressed them many times throughout her career and predicted that a fanatical fear of food would take over the country's dining habits. Huh. Very Correct. insightful. And that focusing too much on nutrition takes away the pleasure from enjoying food. So I think that was like kind of a good thing where she was like, she was worried about food education and like making sure that everyone was like eating good food, but then saying like not to take it too far that you can't like focus too much on nutrition or else your food's not going to be enjoyable. And then she said, everyone is overreacting. If fear of food continues, it will be the death of gastronomy. 
which we talked about, in the United States. Fortunately, the French don't suffer from the same hysteria we do. We should enjoy food and have fun. It is one of the simplest and nicest pleasures in life. Oh, yeah, I love that. Yeah, and I think it's important, you know, like everything in moderation. I'm not a nutritionist, but I think like there is something to be said for like making sure you don't focus too much on something. Oh, absolutely. To the point that it leads to like practically a phobia of it. Her kitchen was actually designed by her husband and it was the set for three of her television shows, which is adorable. Mm -hmm. And it's actually on display at the National Museum of American History. I don't know how they managed to put her entire kitchen into a museum. I'm very intrigued by that process. But love it. (laughs) (laughs) But it was like a fully functional set. TV quality lighting, three cameras positioned to catch all angles of the room, massive Mm -hmm. center island with a gas stove top on one side, electric on the other, and then the rest of her appliances were left alone. And then her copper pots and pans were apparently also displayed in Napa, California for a while, but then in August 2009, they reunited them with her kitchen so cool. <laughs> they're all together. <laughs> she died of kidney failure in Montecito, California in 2004, which was actually two days shy of her 92nd birthday. So quite a long life. Yeah, And wow. ended her last book saying, with thinking back on it now, it reminds me that the pleasures of the table and of life are infinite. Uh, and then said, basically, Trajor bon appetit. Ah, so. I love that. Her ashes were placed on the Neptune Memorial Reef near Key Biscayne, Florida, and she continues to be like one of the most notable and recognizable figures in American cooking and celebrity Aww. chefs. So like quite a huge impact that she had. There's so much more about like her books and her she has a foundation and like all sorts of stuff. So definitely like check more about her as well. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention that I forgot. She used to be like kind of anti-gay like anti-homosexual like Mm -hmm. and was very kind of vocal about that then she had a close friend who actually contracted aids and died from it but she would go on to be like a huge advocate for um like gay rights and everything with that diagnosis Mm -hmm. and loss so it did like completely change that her aspect that she had and i thought that was really cool like that moment of growth and everything that she had within herself so Love that. Amazing. Okay, well, I'm going to talk about Paula Dean. And listen, Paula Dean is a controversial subject. <laughs> I recognize that. But to talk about who she is. So, I mean, she's an American chef, cookbook author, TV personality. She resides in Savannah, Georgia now, where she owns and operates the Lady and Sons restaurants and Paula Dean's Creek House with her sons, Jamie and Bobby Dean. And she's published 15 cookbooks. There's actually like a Paula Dean restaurant up like by the mall in Nashville that like Oh, well, really? Like, hey, wait, there's Paula Jean. In my research, I found it actually didn't even open until 2020, which was surprising to me. But anyways, so I did think, though, that her story is like how and why she started cooking was really nice because she was 19 when her father died unexpectedly, just at the age of 40. And then her mother died four years later at 44. So she lost both of her parents very young. And prior to her dad's death, she married at age 18. She married Jimmy Dean. Um, And then in 1967, they had their first son, James, Jamie. And then in 1970, they had their second son. So in her 20s, though, she suffered from pretty severe depression. And she began to spend more time just preparing food for her family, basically because it was the one thing she could do that wouldn't make her leave her home. And her cooking style had been, was like very influenced by her grandmother, Irene Paul, who had taught her the art of Southern cooking that uh, she described herself as, quote, the real farmhouse cooking, the kind that takes all day. Oh, my Um, least favorite kind of cooking. (laughs) Literally same. (laughs) In 1989, her and her husband, Jimmy, divorced. And so she just really needed to to support herself and her two sons and apparently also her younger brother, Earl. And so she tried various different like businesses in order to support herself, but then eventually started a catering service that she called the Big Lady, where she would make lunches for office workers. And then her sons, Jamie and Bobby, delivered. So this, yeah, was a really successful venture. And so she actually took over the restaurant in the Best Western Hotel in Savannah in 1991 and called it The Lady. And then in January of 1996, after five years at this Best Western, 
they officially opened their very first restaurant called The Lady and Sons Mm -hmm. in downtown Savannah, which is the restaurant that I think is like still there. During this time or soon after is when she starts her relationship with the Food Network that began in 1991 when a friend introduced her to Gordon Elliott. And Gordon Elliott took her through, like basically took her through the city for a series of door knock dinners And I think that she just like did so well on it that she was invited to shoot a pilot named Afternoon Tea in early 2001. Uh, And the network really liked the pilot, but then eventually just decided to give Dean her own show called Paula's Home Cooking, which premiered in November of 2002. And then it was actually originally taped in Millbrook, New York at Elliot's home, but then later it was recorded in her own home in Savannah, Georgia. Hmm. And then in 1997, so this is kind of like all happening within that like probably like 1996 to 2002 is when, you know, Mm -hmm. opens the restaurant, gets on the Food Network. Um, Then the year after the restaurant opened in 97, she self-published the Lady and Sons Savannah Country Cookbook and the Lady and Sons 2, a whole new batch of recipes from Savannah. And then they both feature like traditional Southern recipes. And I mean, so much of her career has been just like, and then she was on this TV show and then she made this TV show and then she made this cookbook. (laughs) Like she, you know, just took the world by storm. In June of 2013, there was a controversy regarding the fact that she was sued by a, I think, former employee because of her use of racial slurs and the treatment towards others. It was kind of interesting. Like she kind of admitted to it in a way where, (laughs) but like in the way that she admitted it, it was kind of like, yeah, I probably did say some off color things, but haven't we all kind of a vibe? Mm, And... (laughs) But then I think was like, oh, but that was before I learned it was wrong. I don't know. But in 2013, as a result, um, the Food Network announced that they would not renew her contract as a result of the way she, like, you know, handled that and everything that was gone on. But, like, I will say, like, she's had success ever since. Like, you know, that hasn't stopped her career by any means. I don't know Mm. if she's still involved in the Food Network, but, like, she does have her own shows And has opened her own restaurant since and still published cookbooks. So, like, she is still just preaching the art of good Southern cooking. And you know what? Moving to the South, I get it. I love me some biscuits and (laughs) overly fried food. It's it's great. It's amazing. Um, But, yeah, anyways. So, there is the brief synopsis of Paula Deen, her controversy. And you know what? She has, I'll admit, she's recovered from it. So, But we do not approve of racism. But we do not condone her. It's so weird. She made a mark on the world. People knew it was wrong even from the beginning, right? We're not one to speak on that because I'm not sure. But I always knew it was wrong my whole life. Yeah, I always knew it was wrong too. (laughs) So I struggle when people are like, we always was before I knew it was wrong. And I'm like, well, I guess they're older than me. But I'm like, I don't know. Anyways, though, (laughs) funny Paula Dean. Oh, gosh. Famous for her use of butter. I think that's what I know her for. Everyone yes. talks about how much butter she uses, which is like kind of a staple in Southern cooking, right? I was just going to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah there's like, here is like a whole stick. Southern cooking. Okay. I'm really excited to talk about this next person. I didn't know who she was at all until this and mm-hmm. love to hear it. Um, Her name is Lena Richard and she was born in September of 1892 and was a chef, cookbook author, restauranteur, frozen food entrepreneur, and television host. Cool. Yeah. Uh, she also was the first black woman to ever host her own television cooking show, which oh, aired amazing. in October of 1949 on WDSU, whatever that stands for. So mm-hmm. her culinary education was very local to New Orleans. And then she also attended Boston, where she went to a school founded by Fanny Farmer. She graduated in 1918 and then returned to New Orleans and opened her own catering business and several restaurants. She also ended up opening a cooking school in 1937 in New Orleans specifically for Black students. And then in 1939, she self-published her cookbook called Lena Richards Cookbook. And it made her the first Black author to feature New Orleans Creole cuisine. Oh, cool. Which, thank heavens, because it's so good. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Her culinary training started when she was employed by the Varon family of New Orleans as, like, a domestic worker. 
And then they were the ones who sent her to the Fanny Farmer Cooking School in Boston. And then during the next two decades, she also started multiple businesses and worked at the as the cook at the New Orleans Club, which was like this elite organization for white women. Mm. Okay. Blah. <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> I'm sure the food was great. Um, <laughs> in 1937, her and her daughter Marie started the cooking school. And as a historian wrote, Richard's school targeted young black men and women. She sought to train them in the culinary sciences so as to give them a chance to make a career for themselves in a city that historically disenfranchised African Americans. That's so important. We've talked about that, I think, in our Elizabeth Hobbs Keckley episode mm-hmm. as well, how like in times of the past, they would learn like these trades in order to make themselves more employable because mm-hmm. it was the only thing that they could do. So like sewing and cleaning and cooking. And I think it's cool that she was able to take something that was kind of out of necessity and then turn it into this, like, art and celebration of Creole cuisine. Yeah. She traveled to promote her book to New York City and sold 700 copies during one month trip. Wow. And was also featured in the New York Times and the Times Herald Tribune. And then she was recruited to be the head chef at the Bird and Bottle Inn in Garrison, New York. And she worked there for 18 months. Until she returned to New Orleans and opened Lena's Eatery in November of 1941. Amazing. Yes. One other thing that she did, she was recruited by Colonial Williamsburg to be the Mm -hmm. chef at the Travis House. And she cooked there for dignitaries and military leaders. It's like very prominent chef, if you can't tell. They're like, oh, this exclusive club wanted her and this exclusive club wanted her. One other thing, I mentioned in the beginning that she was a frozen food entrepreneur, and that is the truth. In 1946, she started a frozen food business where she created fully packaged dinners that were cooked and then flown across the United States, and then they were able to be prepared and served. Wow. Like a good old frozen dinner. Which, yeah. Thank heavens, because yes, literally <laughs> they're very needed. Yeah. Her last restaurant that she opened in 1949 was called the Gumbo House, and it employed most of her family and remained open until after her death. And her cooking show was from 1949 to 1950. It was a 30 minute cooking television show called Lena Richards New Orleans Cookbook. It aired twice weekly and was broadcast on New Orleans' first television station. And during the program, her and her assistant, Marie Matthews, would guide them through recipes from her cookbook. And that made them the first African-Americans to host a cooking show in an age where few households owned television sets. Wow. So just very cool and amazing that she's there. There's not a ton on her, but I just think Mm -hmm. it's such an incredible story, like frozen food entering (laughs) Creole cuisine. Um, And being such a prominent chef at a time when it was really hard for. Totally. That's so cool. The last person we're talking about is Rachel Ray. And I feel like Rachel Ray is the one that I remember the most. Like my Mm -hmm. mom would watch Rachel Ray cooking shows. Like when I could come home home from work, I feel like I remember her. Yeah. Watching She's like still going, right? Oh, she's still going. Yeah. Yeah. I checked her TikTok. Like she posts TikToks with her little cooking recipes. So Rachel Ray on TikTok. Mm -hmm. She was born 1968. She's an American cook, television personality businesswoman and author. She hosted the syndicated daily talk and lifestyle program, Rachel Ray. The whole talk show named after her. She's on a lot of television shows. I did not realize. (laughs) The first one, which I'll talk, is like 30-minute meals, Rachel Ray's Tasty Travels, $40 a day, Rachel Ray's Week in a Day. And then there was a reality format show, Rachel versus Guy, Celebrity Cook-Off. Rachel. Oh, guy like Guy Fieri. Fieri. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And then there's Rachel Ray's Kids Cook-Off. So, so many television shows. And then has written several cookbooks based off of the 30-minute meal concept and also launched a magazine every day with Rachel in 2006. Wow. So, so An much. An empire. An empire. Also, she won three Daytime Emmy Awards in 2006. So, oh wait, that was in 2006. Just throughout her television shows, she's hmm. won three Daytime Emmy- Emmys, which is crazy. She was born in Glenn's Falls, New York. And when she was eight, her family moved to Lake George, New York, where her mother managed restaurants in New York's Capital District. So I think that like just her family, she was just surrounded by people who were managing restaurants and food just growing up. In 1995, after she graduated, she moved to New York City and she first worked at the Macy's Marketplace candy counter. Um, And then they actually tried to promote her to be like in the accessory department. So then she just quit and moved jobs to Agatha and Valentina, which was a specialty food store. So Mm -hmm. she was just always around food. 
she moved back to where her family was from and managed Mr. Brown's pub at the Sagamore, which is a hotel on Lake George. So from there, she became a buyer at Cohen and Lobel, I believe, which is a gourmet market in Albany, New York. And this is where she credits the idea of 30 minute meals, uh, because when she was working at the store, she would meet a lot of people who were just really reluctant to cook. And so while she was there, she taught a course in which she showed how to make meals in less than 30 minutes. And so her classes there became very successful and it was just 30 minute meals classes. So the local CBS TV show, which was called WRGB, they asked her to appear weekly on just the weekly local news to do these 30 minute meals. And then this, along with other public radio broadcasts, and then she also published her first book, led to the Today Show reaching out. So she would have a Today Show spot for the 30 minute meals with Rachel Ray. And then she had her first Food Network contract in 2001. And that started with her 30 minute meals. TV show. That's really cool. Yeah, I know. Uh, there's also another TV show that I had not heard of where called $40 a day that she was the host of from 2002 to 2005, where she would travel to various destinations and attempt to eat three meals for $40 a day. Yeah, that could not happen now. Yeah, I was going to say literally no way. But, <laughs> yeah. but um, I guess 2002, what a bright time. It could have happened. History. $40 a day. I guess. Gosh, $40 can't get you much now. I know. Uh, you go to lunch once. Anyways. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But Rachel Ray, her whole like cooking philosophy is like quick, easy cooking styles. And her point is that she teaches just many simple recipes that she says can be completed in 30 minutes or less. Although apparently people will kind of critics will say that that does not include the preparation time. For OK, some I was going to say how. I mean, <laughs> I get it. I mean, it's catchy to say 30 minutes or less. And yeah, it sounds more great. Or less close enough, I guess. She actually says that her Sicilian maternal grandfather, Emmanuel um, Scuderi, and her Cajun ancestry both have strong influences on her cooking. Uh, she uses ingredients such as fresh herbs, garlic, chicken stock to boost flavors, and believes me measuring, quote, takes away the creative hands-on process of cooking. She instead favors approximations such as half a palm or a two-pan swirl. Yes. Um, do you want to know a quick fun fact? I would love to. $40 in 2002 is $68 today. Well, there we go. You could Good probably eat three meals for $68. Out at restaurants, yeah. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> Interesting. Well, I just had to you. know. <laughs> thank you for the conversion. <laughs> yeah. Um, sometimes people will criticize her like shortcut techniques, but her response is, quote, I have no formal anything. I'm completely unqualified for any job I've ever had. She's also repeatedly just said, well, I'm not a chef. But I think that it kind of goes along with like, I mean, Julia Child was obviously very, very trained, but people liked her because it felt like it was accessible and that it was something yeah. that they could do too. And I think that's the whole appeal of Rachel Ray. She obviously grew up in restaurants, grew up around food. That was her jobs, you know, so she obviously knew how to cook. It was just she figured out a way to make it approachable. I just thought this was a funny little tidbit where it's like on her television program, she's used catchphrases such as EVOO, which is extra version olive oil, um, yummo, GB for the garbage bowl. Oh, my gravy, delish, entretizer which is an entree-sized appetizer, a stoop, cross between a soup and a stew. <laughs> <laughs> a stoop. And a choop, thicker than a soup, but thinner than a chowder. And then in 2007, the Oxford American College Dictionary announced the addition to the term EVU, or extra virgin olive oil, however she actually says it, short for it, which she helped to popularize, and they credited her with coining the phrase. Man. So good for I her. I do remember hearing once in my life someone saying, oh, like the Evu. And I was like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Extra version olive oil. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Evu. And apparently one of her specialties is burgers. Didn't know that. And one of her books is The Book of Burger. She actually hosted 30 Minute Meals on the Food Network for 11 seasons from 2001 to 2012. And then there was a revival of the series that started in 2019. And then in 2005, she signed a deal to host a daytime TV talk show, which was called Rachel Ray. And that premiered on September 18th of 2006 and then actually aired until May 24th of this year. Oh, wow. I didn't realize it had gone on that long. I didn't so, either. That's yeah. that was a long career. I know. And like we mentioned, she is still doing stuff. She'll still post videos on TikTok and everything 
went on her Instagram because I was curious and there was like a post where she was like, this is my first labor free Labor Day in so long. And I was like, oh, well, that now I know why, because the show oh, just yeah. ended. So a couple That's months cool. ago. So, yeah, go Rachel Ray. Still out there Good doing, for her. doing the thing. An empire. Truly. I know. I didn't actually even realize just how big that empire spanned. So Cool. Well, now I'm hungry. Me too. <laughs> My <laughs> husband, in fact, was actually cooking dinner as we were recording. And so I can now smell. There I think he go. actually made burgers. So Yum. I'm very excited to go eat myself a big juicy burger. Yeah, I'm I'm starving now. <laughs> After talking about food for the talking past about hour. Good food. Well, thanks for being here and listening. I hope you feel inspired to go eat some good food because mm-hmm. now I now I'm want to cook something. And as per usual, we have episodes coming out every Monday. Excited for December. We'll do our best to make it kind of holiday themed. Heading into the new year and subscribe on YouTube or on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Leave a rating review. I'll be back things. next week. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.